Well, good morning to everyone. Thank you for making your way into deep Northwest Washington today at CSIS for this great mini conference that we're having on our unmanned systems report. My name is uh, Kathleen Hicks. I run the international security program here. And it's really my, and I have a little bit of a um, allergy, so please excuse my voice. It's really my pleasure to introduce today's two panels, um, starting with the one that Colonel Griffin is leading. But this is really all um, related to the report CSIS has recently released on sustaining the U.S. lead in unmanned systems. Um, among the report's recommendations includes the development of an office within DOD and specifically directly reporting to the Deputy Secretary of Defense for unmanned systems. Some of you may know that that uh, recommendation has been picked up by um, Congressman Forbes and is among his proposals uh, for the NDAA. So that's one of the things we'll want to discuss today. Uh, but there are many other recommendations and um, um, findings of the report that I think you'll find of interest if you hadn't had a chance to read through it. And really today is a great um, opportunity for us to hear from all of you, from our great panelists that we've pulled together on the recommendations of the report and really where to go from here. This is a very hot topic in Washington right now <clears throat> in many different types of circles. And I, we think that's a great part of the um, debate is that it's open and wide and there's a lot of uh, transparent conversation happening. Um, and, and one of the things that we really want to highlight is the need to move from the whiz-bang piece of what are unmanned systems into the actual application of moving forward for the United States in this area. And the, as the report makes clear, the world is moving forward on unmanned systems. They're moving forward in the commercial sector, in the military sector, and certainly overseas. And so the question before the United States is not whether to have unmanned systems. It's about how to best integrate them and how to be at the cutting edge and the forefront of the technology while thinking through all of its implications, both positive and negative. I do want to just thank Colonel Griffin in particular. Sam Brannon has been the lead of this study. You're going to see a lot from Sam today. He'll, he'll lead the second panel. He's done a fantastic job. But Colonel Griffin, who is our Air Force fellow for this year, could have come into this center and spent his year relaxing and going off to play golf probably, and we may not have known, but instead he really dug in and worked this issue hard. And uh, he's going off to be the vice wing commander at... Um, Lewis McCord, Joint, Joint Base Lewis McCord, um, and we're very excited for him for that. And let me turn it over to Ethan to introduce the panel, and again, thank you all for participating today. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. Thank you for the kind comments. And as always, the excellent framing uh, perspective on the issue at hand. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to CSIS. Uh, friends of CSIS, uh, military and industry partners, media representatives, and generally all colleagues in this unmanned uh, forum, thank you for coming. Uh, as Kath mentioned, I'm Colonel Ethan Griffin, uh, the U.S. Air Force Fellow here at CSIS. Uh, as Dr. Hicks before me, I'd like to express the gratitude uh, of our unmanned systems team, which is you know Sam Brand and myself and, and Reese McCormick and everyone that's uh, partaken here at CSIS on this topic. I'd like to thank the many companies and organizations that made both this event and our previous working group series possible. Uh, in particular, this, this particular event would not be possible without the tremendous intellectual and logistical support of our colleagues, such as Mr. Reese McCormick, Mr. Andrew Metrick, Mr. Sam Brothers, Mr. Madison Riley, and Mr. Gabriel Cole, among others. And most importantly, I'd like to take a moment to thank our uh, distinguished panelists today. Uh, they have volunteered their time, intellect, and uh, possibly careers uh, to come here and speak to you on the present and future for unmanned systems. Uh, and Mike uh, has, has just joined us here, so I'm glad to see him. We believe the continued evolution of unmanned systems and the United States' role is an important topic that affects our national security. As such, we're gathered here to discuss uh, through the Department of Defense lens, both the status of unmanned systems today and their future. Our first of two panels this morning, Service Perspectives in Fiscal Year 15 and Beyond, we're extremely fortunate to have three experienced officers from the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps that are at the leading edge of strategy, resourcing, and implementation of unmanned systems technology within the Department of Defense. As they're able, they've generously offered their time to provide their services perspective 
Uh, where their continued service in uniform might be in question, uh, they may just say it's their own personal thoughts. So bear with them on those. I'll ask each to offer a few brief opening remarks, after which I'll pose a few questions and then turn it over for Q&A. Uh, as a reminder, prior to the Q&A period, uh, if you could please silence all cell phones, uh, and they may interfere with our quadcopters, uh, so I would appreciate if you turn those signals off. Uh, our fl flight profile today will terminate promptly at 11 a.m., uh, so that we make time for Sam Brannon to moderate the second panel, U.S. leadership amid commercial sector growth and changing global supply. And help me keep me on time. When you do get a question uh, or do get the microphone, please state your name, affiliation, and a concise question. Uh, I'm not very good at, uh, at interrupting and moderating, so I count on you guys to self-control. Self so without further ado, Colonel Ken Hallahan, uh, two down to my right, U.S. Air Force is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and holds a doctorate degree in management. He is a rated aviator with over 3,000 flying hours in training aircraft, airlift aircraft, as well as the MQ-1 Predator. Colonel Callahan has seen firsthand the rise of the remotely piloted aircraft, or RPA, uh, sweet, properly, uh, properly termini terminology there, right? Uh, he has seen the rise of the RPA within the Air Force, having commanded the 46th Expeditionary Reconnaissance Squadron at Balad, Iraq, as well as having served as the Director of Staff for the 432nd Airlift Wing at Creech Air Force Base, Nevada. Presently, Colonel Callahan is the Director for Remotely Piloted Aircraft Capabilities, Headquarters Air Staff at the Pentagon, where he advises senior leadership on RPA capabilities and policies. To my right, immediately, is Captain Chris Corgnati, U.S. Navy. He is a graduate of Villanova University, holds a master's degree in information technology management from the Naval Postgraduate School. Tough assignment. And he is a career maritime patrol and reconnaissance aviator. Captain Cordinati has six deployments across AORs to his credit and has commanded at the squadron level as well. Uh, specifically, Patrol Squadron 1, VP1, Whidbey Island, Washington. Captain Cordinati currently serves as the Director of Airborne Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Capabilities, managing resources for all Navy manned and unmanned airborne ISR capabilities. And finally, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Hickson, uh, down to my right at the end, U.S. Marine Corps, a combat engineer by trade, has served as an engineer in every element of the Marine Air Ground Task Force during his career. Lieutenant Colonel Hickson is currently assigned to Headquarters U.S. Marine Corps, Combat Development and Integration Department in Quantico as the Unmanned Ground Systems Capabilities Integration Officer, where he is responsible for managing the incorporation of unmanned systems into present-day company tactics and operations. And with that, gentlemen, I will turn to Colonel Callahan for a few opening remarks, followed by our other two distinguished guests. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks, for everybody, for coming. I'm glad to see uh, such a full room, not something I usually uh, get to experience. Uh, I could certainly talk to th about this topic all day, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll keep my comments kind of short and uh, talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going in a, in a very uh, concise manner. Uh, probably the best way to kick off what the Air Force is doing right now in the world of RPAs is to point everybody towards our recently released RPA vector. Uh, if you Google the Air Force RPA vector online, you can, uh, should get a copy, an electronic copy come up. If it doesn't, then just contact Air Force PA. Uh, and I'm going to reference a few things that are in the vector and then a few things that we're doing in relation to the vector. Uh, on the very first page of the vector, there's a quote by a good friend and mentor, uh, Colonel uh, Retired uh, Bill Sweet Tart, and he talks a little bit about the, the history uh, of, of air power, and he makes reference to post-World War I, meaning air power coming out of World War I uh, was a viable technology. We knew it was going to work in combat. We knew it was exciting, but we didn't really have flushed out what, how we were going to use air power in uh, future conflict. Uh, and in a similar respect, RPAs are kind of the same way. We've, we've used them now in Iraq and Afghanistan. They've been very effective. We know that the technology is viable. We know that it's exciting. Uh, we initially used it just like in World War I for reconnaissance. Then we uh, decided, just like in World War I, as we're looking at enemy troops, it would be nice to be able to strike uh, enemy at the same time. So we armed them. And uh, now we're looking at what are the future roles of of these, uh, this technology that we've built. And much like air power at the end of World War I, there's some combat uh, 
capability there. And then there's also some industrial uh, commercial sector capabilities that are, that are viable. Uh, and some of these problems will be solved by the Air Force or our joint partners, uh, and some of these problems will be solved by industry. Uh, and, and, and that's the exciting point of where we are today and uh, how we're going to use these things. Strategically, if you look at where we are, and this is where I think it ties directly to the report that uh, Ethan mentioned, is we're, the United States remains a global power. We're reducing uh, our presence in Iraq and Afghanistan. We went from being saturating airspace and, and massing over one country's uh, borders to now we're, we're dispersing back out into a global uh, environment where we're trying to pay attention to several strategic problems all at the same time. And in the context of, of, or in that context, the RPA is, is a great weapon system. With uh, utilizing remote split ops like the Air Force does, uh, we can change theaters fairly rapidly. Uh, we could, uh, just by rebooting our ground control station and rebriefing our crews. Uh, the, the longest part of that is the decision to, uh, to unlink with one airplane and link up with another. Uh, so it's a powerful weapon that supports sort of this global environment that we're in. And what we're really seeing is the, uh, the global air AOR, if you will, is shrinking to where we're not really worried about which, which lines on the map we're in, and it's more about how do we maintain a presence on a global scale. Uh, and those are the types of problems that we're going to solve in the future. Uh, one of the things mentioned in the report or was referenced was the Horowitz book about the diffusion of military power. And as uh, in reference to the report, it talks about a lot of times uh, the countries that develop new military technologies are not always the ones that figure out how to use them. Uh, so we're at the point as the United States, certainly as the DOD and, and, and without a doubt the United States Air Force needs to spend some time thinking hard about how we want to use these systems, what mission sets we want to get into, and where we want to invest our time and money. And that, that thinking is where we are today. And uh, hopefully we get that right, because it's important to national security. All right. Fantastic. Thanks for those comments. Uh, Captain Cornati, to you. Okay. First of all, thanks, uh, Dr. Hicks and Sam, Ethan, and CSIS for the invitation uh, and the continued work in the field of unmanned systems. I think uh, what you're doing uh, is important and has been certainly productive to date, and I think will continue to be so. But it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the conversation and the inter interaction. Uh, I enjoyed reading through the report. Um, that came out of the last set of roundtables. I think I was able to attend two of the four uh, due to scheduling, but uh, largely I think uh, the, the report was right. I think the uh, issues that were identified and most of the root causes were spot on. So I, I, I again, appreciated reading the wrap-up for the portions that I wasn't able to participate in. I think the, the Navy uh, certainly understands the value on man and how we want to integrate and employ uh, the unmanned capabilities initially. Uh, and I use the word initially because we, we are where the Air Force was probably a decade ago. Um, we don't have nearly um, the, the variety of platforms, the flight hours, uh, the operational experience that the Air Force had. Um, so we're really looking forward to getting these out in the fleet in the hands of sailors and, and see what we can do with them. Uh, we've probably only scratched the surface of, of what we can do. I think the biggest proponents of unmanned aircraft in the Navy today are anybody who's actually been out in the fleet and used them. If you talk to anyone from the 5th Fleet AOR, from the three-star commander on down, uh, they can't get enough of BAMS-D. Uh, if, if he had his preference, uh, they'd fly every day, sometimes two at a time, um, and, and we have to temper that, uh, that appetite uh, from the Pentagon. But the operational impact of that aircraft every time it takes off is huge and can't be overstated. And any uh, of our soft brothers who've been out uh, working with the, uh, the fire scouts on the operations uh, they've done. Uh, continue to sing the praises of that platform. And as we get Fire Scout more out into the maritime and on to LCS, uh, again, we're going to open up the aperture of what that platform and that capability can do uh, in the maritime environment. And again, we're just at the, the very forefront of, uh, of doing that. Um, I mentioned the Air Force and their experiences. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that uh, the cooperation amongst the services right now uh, in the field of RPA is as, as good as it's ever been. Um, in my estimation. And that, that started with a, a couple of flag and general officers about a year ago and a couple of colonels and captains who, who picked it up and ran with it. Um, that continues today on air vehicles, uh, the future of ground control stations, interoper interoperability issues, um, uh, PED architectures, uh, certainly. Again, the, the Air Force has got a much more robust uh, architecture 
um, a different model, but something we certainly want to leverage and learn from as we go forward. The Navy may end up as a hybrid. Uh, we've got ships at sea that need direct uh, PED capabilities, but probably not all of it. So we're, we're looking at all the remote sighting possibilities uh, along the Air Force model, and that'll certainly be, I think, part of our final solution, but we're probably gonna have to have a piece of it afloat uh, for those times when you get into an A2AD environment or the comm links go down. Uh, you don't wanna lose the, the, the capability. You gotta, you gotta fight through that. So again, I just wanted to highlight, uh, certainly with our, with our Marines, uh, I've, I've got a Lieutenant Colonel in my office working Marine Corps issues where it crosses with Navy. Uh, every day uh, on a multiple multiple programs. So that link historically obviously has been very tight and continues to be so, but the, the new piece probably is the Navy Air Force uh, cooperation over the last two years has been outstanding. Um, one of the things we always like to talk about is how we're gonna integrate um, capabilities into the fleet. So, you know, primarily Triton, U-Class, and Fire Scout are the big three we're working today. And we're integrating those into warfare communities. We're not setting up an unmanned community. And that's, that's not to say that the Air Force is wrong for doing that. It's just a different mindset and a different model. It's probably pros and cons to both. Um, but we want, we're gonna use fleet experienced aviators and air crew to operate these systems much like they would their manned aircraft. They have the expertise in the mission sets, the environments, um, and the things that we do as a Navy that we're also gonna use unmanned to do, and, and in some cases do much better. So the same folks with the same warfare focused mindset uh, and, and expertise of the guys are gonna be guys and gals that are gonna be operating these systems as we introduce them to the fleet. Um, so again, just a, a different mindset that, that, that we've gone into this with. Um, I mentioned service cooperation. Um, we don't have an RPA vector-like uh, product. Uh, those that have been around and worked with the Navy in the past know we don't do doctrine uh, nearly as well as some of the other services. So uh, we, we have yet to codify uh, a lot of our thoughts, but the, uh, the thinking and work uh, is, is definitely uh, ongoing up at the, the, the highest levels of the Navy. Um, I can tell you we get a lot of um, very hands-on, interesting guidance from senior Navy leaders on a variety of our programs, uh, especially lately. So uh, we'll talk about a little bit of that. Uh, obviously, if, if it looks like I'm being cautious and I'm dodging any of your questions, uh, specifically related to maybe you class, it's because I probably am. Um, but I will, I will answer to the greatest extent possible, but, to, but bear with me if it uh, looks like I'm choosing my words carefully. So again, I look forward to the conversation. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Captain Coronati. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hickson, on to you, please. Thank and you, sir. Uh, Dr. Hickson, uh, Colonel Griffin, uh, thank you again for the, uh, the invitation. Uh, I, I have the luxury of uh, speaking last and getting to say that I echo all their comments. Um, uh, on the Marine side, um, and it's, it's much the same. Uh, I'll go back to pre-9-11. Uh, we started with a whole bunch of VOD robots on the ground and uh, organized structure for VMU uh, with UAS platforms. And uh, with uh, defense industry, uh, private sector, uh, joint and service uh, technology development, uh, only highlighted the um, uh, force multiplier and capabilities that... Uh, uh, unmanned ground and air systems uh, do bring to the MAGTAF, uh, Marine Air Ground Task Force. Uh, OIF, OEF uh, exploded, expanded that, um, that capability enhancement for us. Uh, so I'll fast forward 12 years from 9-11. Uh, uh, we will transition what we have uh, come to use and really rely on uh, in uh, OIF, OEF uh, on the ground side, uh, almost strictly for ISR, uh, counter IED and uh, some targeting, um, but to get an infantryman to carry a robot with him uh, or use a throwable robot for ISR or looking around corners for point targets um, can't be overstated. So uh, we have come a long way as a Marine Corps in using uh, some of these ground platforms. Uh, more of the same on the, on the air side, but with a lot more uh, priority in the way of uh, fiscal budgeting applied to it. And, and we, are all, we are all under a lot of fiscal constraints. So uh, we really can't roll out anything new. And I would say the best thing that the Marine Corps has rolling out that is new is the RQ-21. Uh, so we will, we will rely on that. And that would be a healthy bridging capability between uh, what our uh, VMU or uh, aviation combat element, UAS, Group 3 UAS uh, um, uh, pilots use, uh, out to what the ground combat element, what those infantrymen will be using uh, in the near future. And this RQ-21 Blackjack will be fielding uh, this year, and it will see some operational uh, deployments and, uh, and employment. So 
uh, future is bright. Uh, I wish the uh, fiscal uh, outlook was uh, much the same. Uh, this would bound uh, leaps forward. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have what we have from OEF. Uh, we will continue to use this in our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab uh, in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the Joint Services uh, and Defense Industry. We'll continue to uh, look at how we can uh, roll in uh, the future uh, technology in unmanned systems uh, and enhance the MAGTAF capabilities. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Hickson. Appreciate those comments. Uh, I, we're doing good on time. I'm going to ask uh, two questions, and then I'll open it up to Q&A. So if all our, uh, all our audience can begin considering their questions that they might have. And just a one, one comment, if it appears that we've uh, left out any of our brothers and sisters in arms, uh, that was not deliberate by any means. Uh, we've been, Sam and I and the rest of the team, been very engaged with our Coast Guard brethren uh, throughout the series. And we had an Army uh, expert that was going to sit on the panel, but unfortunately, uh, some aviation delays prohibited him from coming. So uh, that it goes without saying that those discussions continue behind the scenes and the collaboration continues. So with the uh, release of the recently of the Quadrennial Defense Review and fiscal year 2015's presidential budget, uh, I think each of you gentlemen have addressed uh, your services, integration and acquisition uh, in the near term, future term from a broad perspective. Uh, one question I'd like to ask is, uh, as we're all very familiar with the budget uh, and fiscal constraints, um, what other challenges are you seeing within the community and within your service? Uh, you know, whether that be uh, from a manning perspective, a training perspective, uh, Captain Coordinator, you kind of hit on a, a different outlook that the Navy has uh, from the Air Force. What other challenges are your communities or your services facing as you try to integrate under fiscal stress uh, the capabilities and um, experiences of unmanned systems? And where could collaboration uh, facilitate that? Where do you see opportunity for greater collaboration, whether that be with industry or with uh, other services? Um, and one note I'll make on that is, as Dr. Hicks mentioned, uh, one of the recommendations out of the report uh, has, has caught some attention, and that's the establishment of a uh, Defense Unmanned Systems Office. So feel free to comment on that or just address, you know, what challenges you're facing and what collaboration opportunities there are. To any one of you to start, thanks. Okay. Um, so on the challenges, the manning is certainly a challenge, and, and part of that is because of the way we have chosen to stand this up. But we're also in a, man, in a manpower drawdown. So all the services are on a, on a glide path to uh, lessen the number of folks in the service. So as you bring on new capabilities, unless you're directly replacing something, that's additive in nature. So you've got to go find that manpower uh, within the system, within a shrinking pool. And you've got competing demands, cyber and other things that are, that are, are uh, certainly demand signals on Navy manpower and I'm sure for the other services as well. Um, and, and getting the manning and manpower right um, to keep current capabilities uh, operating effectively for as long as possible before we make those transitions. Um, the, the, the one we, we work uh, extensively right now is with Triton. Um, that manpower is going to come out of, of my uh, old MPRA community from P3 and P8 uh, and the EP3 and SPA as, as uh, we sunset those uh, capabilities towards the end of the decade. Uh, so managing that to maintain their warfighting relevance today through the, through the end of the decade, but also harvest some of that manpower and, and uh, have a, uh, a smooth transition to get the capabilities out. Um, so that, that's certainly a challenge. And, and uh, the training aspect um, we're working through right now some of the first combined ab debts are going to be deploying uh, within the next uh, year or so on LCS. So those are normally MH-60 Romeo or Sierra debts, uh, normal wing naval aviator helicopter uh, folks out there operating those helicopters. They're going to be dual qualified with additional training to operate both the manned helicopters as well as Fire Scout. Um, so we're working through, they're actually uh, uh, underway at sea right now. Uh, to try and flesh out some of the, the, the identify some of the challenges of, of what are the restrictions, how do you switch between the man and the unman. When you've got one airborne, you've got to keep a deck spot ready in case they need to come back and land. How do you, just the logistics of moving helicopters in and out of the hangar, flight time, 
maintaining currencies, all those things, we think we know the answer, but we haven't yet proven it. So we're out uh, actually at sea today uh, working on that problem. So the training piece, uh, certainly. Um, some of the other uh, communities that we, we envision will not be operating them simultaneously like the helicopters. Uh, Triton will take that manpower and at different points in their career, P3 and P8 uh, folks will move over and operate Triton. But when they're doing that, they'll be Triton operators and, and not trying to switch back and forth between the two. Uh, U-Class, we're still in, the, in, uh, in discussions with the Air Boss and the Naval Aviation Enterprise as to what is the right model, what's the right flavor of, of folks to have in that squadron and that, that construct. So that's still, that work's still ongoing. Um, on the collaboration part, I, I mentioned on, on that earlier, uh, and, and it has been excellent, but one of the things I've also seen on the GAPS issue that you mentioned is um, certainly across the department, the Joint Staff and USDI, um, are taking a holistic view of ISR across the department. And they're, for individual programs, it may not be evident, but as we go in and we talk to, again, to primarily the USDI and the Joint Staff, we say this is where we think our capability fits amongst the entire joint force. And then we get a little bit sticking around, hey, I needed a little more here, a little more here, we've got too much of this. So they're doing that balancing, again, across the department to, to address the gaps in capabilities. Right. Um, and then the other, I think, collaboration piece we haven't talked about is, um, again, primarily right now with the Air Force, is on the hail, the high altitude between Global Hawk and Triton as we go forward. Uh, a few years ago, there was a big move to, to, um, to come together and, and find some efficiencies in maintenance and basing and some other things. Then as the, the, I think the Global Hawk discussion sort of perturbated over the last couple of years, we said, okay, we had to make decisions uh, on where we were going to go, but we're still looking, especially on overseas basing, logistics pipelines, depot uh, opportunities. Uh, we continue to look at those to find ways to, to, to be more efficient, save money across the enterprise, because there's no reason both of us should have a, a depot working, uh, two different depots working on the same part uh, for those aircraft. Uh, so, so that work uh, definitely is ongoing. And I think the last comment I'll make is on the, um, the OSD office uh, that you recommended. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Dyke Weatherington and the work he did um, really, I said, I think pushed us along that, that road and he did a tremendous job. Um, but until you sort of get, it's like anything else in the Pentagon, until you get into the budgetary process, you know, it, it's really hard to, to make long-term changes and to cement um, that vision um, unless you've got a, a, a little bit of authority to, uh, to at least coerce the services uh, on the budgetary side uh, to, to implement them. But I think there, there, there could be value added there. I think um, primarily on the interoperability and, and common control uh, aspect of it, that's one that jumps out to me that um, you know, if OSD were to, to, to set up that office and say, you know, thou shalt do it this way, and in the future we wouldn't have 17 or 18 different inter, not interoperable control stations uh, like we do today. Yeah, so this is actually one of my favorite questions. I'm glad you <laughs> asked it. The, uh, so the short answer is uh, doctrine, TTPs, and organizations. And we've already seen it. He's talk we're talking about, uh, you know, it, should there be a lead office at the DOD level? Uh, but just kind of to back out even one more level is anytime you introduce a disruptive technology, which I think the RPA, certainly in the Air Force, have been disruptive uh, by a classic definition, you have to go back and address what needs to change. Uh, and I sit in a lot of meetings where senior leaders will talk about how do we make uh, this disruptive technology normal. Uh, and I would reference them to go talk to someone like a Kodak of how they introduced digital photography into what was a wet film business. It's, it's just something different that has to be dealt with. And it's not that every piece of this, the, this system is, is different. There are some commonalities. If you look at doctrine, even, even the doctrine uh, AFDD-1 that talks about how the Air Force uh, can mass from disparate locations and put effects uh, without the classic definition of getting all your troops in a central location and going over the hill. The, you know, the Air Force solves problems differently. Um, and that's in our, in our broad level doctrine, but it hasn't worked its way into how are we organized. Uh, right now, I work in the A-2. Most other flying platforms are in the A-3. So there's a debate of are we organized properly uh, to handle that. Uh, the other explanation that I often give is, is, you know, if you put an RPA in a stack of airplanes over a target, 
they are just like any other classic aircraft. What makes them different and what we really need to think about is how to parse out the pieces that are, that are dramatically different. Remote split operations, fully networked uh, capabilities that, that can be operated from great distance, that's a capability that not very many other airplanes can do. And I've certainly changed theaters before where I've reset my controls and started flying an airplane in a different theater as I, as I brought up before. So sort of the metaphor I use, and I know I'm on shaky ground here because I've had this pointed out to me before, uh, is sort of a wave particle theory. If you take particles as being kind of the normal, uh, this is the way everybody thinks about things, and you introduce the fact that, that you could also have a, a completely different explanation that's outside of your paradigm, uh, that gets to the uh, Thomas Kuhn book, The Nature of Scientific Revolutions. Of If you've got a paradigm that's been working for years and years and years, it's very hard to change that and to change that thinking. Uh, and the paradigm will continue to work until something doesn't quite fit and there's no explanation for it, and then you go in search of another explanation. So we're, we're kind of at that level of thinking. Uh, I know I need to come up with a better metaphor. Uh, my boss has told me more than once if you're using quantum theory to make something simpler, then you probably <laughs> need a better example. But there is, there is some application to that of identifying what pieces of this will fit in our, in our structure, what pieces need to change organizationally and doctrine and how we think. And I think that's where the Air Force is today on, on this system. Actually, two things we don't use too much is doctrine. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to highlight in the, in the way of collaboration um, our work with the Army. Um, and it, too bad that uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel couldn't uh, make it today. but. Uh, uh, I have spoken with uh, him and his, uh, his brethren uh, in Army requirements uh, and tying the knot on, on the future for uh, some common robotic systems, and, and we do have those. Uh, the Army is, is taking the lead from the Marine Corps on that one, uh, whereas uh, on the systems that we do have on the ground side, uh, they are common. They will be the same. Uh, I think the Army is just a little bit behind because they have, a, I think, a bigger budget um, uh, challenge than the Marine Corps does. Uh, we fenced uh, some ground systems that we will transition into programs of record just to bridge us to that common uh, robotic system on the ground side uh, that the Army is developing. Uh, the DOD office, um, I, I think, is a natural progression from uh, a lot of what we've seen at the SECNAV level uh, with uh, working groups uh, for unmanned systems across the domains, um, which, uh, in telling my colleagues, there is no lack of attention given to unmanned systems. Uh, uh, it would be prudent if we uh, take what we had and roll it into the future. Uh, the challenges we have, uh, I think, uh, might be a little more technical, but um, uh, when, when we roll out uh, or continue to roll out our special MAGTAFs at the company level, uh, those Marines are going to be uh, uh, very distant in, in disparate locations. Uh, they will uh, require uh, a lot of uh, unmanned systems on the air and ground side uh, to enhance their capabilities both uh, uh, close in on the ground side and then at standoff would be by uh, those UAS. So uh, the, the development in that way uh, and coordinate with the joint services uh, when you have uh, marine companies running all over the earth um, uh, trying to defend themselves uh, and do protect themselves at close in uh, distances uh, is going to be critical. So collaboration needs to go on. Uh, the challenge is um, I think are going to be in the way of EW and uh, threat unmanned systems. Uh, we have uh, just started a look into uh, what that might mean specifically, as well as working with the Joint Services and their working groups uh, on what that uh, threat might be to us and how we might uh, uh, combat that. I think I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of the CNO's priorities, um, which is the LDUUV, the, um, I always get it, large diameter unmanned underwater vehicle. Um, as we go through this, again, that's just in the requirements generation stage right now, but uh, certainly I think in the future the Navy uh, um, is going to count on unmanned underwater vehicles um, to, to a great degree as we go forward uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, they, they can obviously do things you don't want to put a manned submarine in to do, um, and they can also supplement um, what is a, uh, uh, certainly a limited asset in our, our uh, submarine force today. Um, so we focused primarily, I think, here on the air side, but didn't want to, uh, to go. Um, and they've got some unique challenges in the undersea because um, they're obviously cut off command and control. We have C2 links. 
satellite links to our to our unmanned, so you always can have the man on the loop and, and you're, you're monitoring. That's a fundamentally different problem when you have a vehicle who's going to submerge for hours, days, or weeks at a time. Um, that's a different challenge. The power challenge is the level of automation and autonomy required uh, is much greater. So they, they may actually lead, I think, within DOD on some of those as we develop those capabilities. Yeah, and that's a great additional point. Um, thanks for all your comments on that question. I'll ask one more quick one before going to the audience. Uh, Many would argue that uh, the U.S. leadership in unmanned systems is uh, becoming tenuous uh, from a technology perspective. Clearly, one of the uh, most obvious advances that uh, the U.S. military has is in its people and in its operational experience, uh, two decades of operating unmanned systems and, and perfecting those uh, chains of command, et cetera. Uh, how are we preserving that experience? Uh, from your from your perspectives, how are we making sure that those lessons learned and those capabilities uh, become organic to the services and and don't uh, die off as we move on to a different geostrategic uh, situation? Yeah, so uh, more than once I've gotten to fly sitting next to a you know twenty year old airman, and uh, I've always felt that I was fairly technology savvy. Uh, you know, growing up operating, having machinery in the Air Force and uh, using computers, we're, we're generally a technical force. Uh, what I found was the airmen sitting next to me uh, typically laughed at me as I was trying to use all of my keyboards and uh, make inputs into the computer. So the, uh, the bottom line is I would say that the kids that are living in their mom's basements today in the United States are better than the kids living in their basements uh, anywhere else in the world. And it's because they have access to technology uh, and it's in their DNA. I mean, uh, they walk around connected with technology, and it's just something that they do. So I, I have a very optimistic look about the future and the, and the youngest airmen as they come up in the Air Force and their ability uh, to use these, um, these technologies. In a, in, a, in a bigger scheme, I would say, in your reference to we've got the experiences, the actual platforms themselves are not, they're, they're interesting, but if you've ever, the first time I looked inside an MQ-1, I was completely unimpressed. It's a couple computers, some servos, and what looked like a DISH network satellite DISH. So uh, it's not a complicated piece of machinery. What's really hard about what we do is how we're networked, <clears throat> excuse me, and how we share information uh, and how we distribute it. Uh, the platforms themselves are, are evolving and will continue to evolve, uh, but the, the ability for command and control and to think about how we employ the uh, assets are, are where we, I think we have the most experience uh, and will continue into the near future. Uh, to, to keep this rolling forward, uh, continue training. And, and the challenge is the, the Marines uh, and sailors in the MAGTAF that use uh, these unmanned systems, uh, at some point they do leave the surface. So, uh, we go back to the schoolhouse to make sure that any of those uh, lessons learned uh, in operational experience is captured by those trainers. Uh, fortunately, or, or you could, I guess you could say unfortunately, they, they are contracted help. Um, uh, the benefit is these are smart guys who reach out to uh, defense industry and they do stay current. Uh, they are not Marines, uh, by and large, that do the training. Um, and not being Marines doing the training, uh, uh, these contra uh, contracted uh, uh, trainers do have uh, a wider access to uh, what is current. Um, Marines do come and go, and uh, without them reaching out, um, would uh, kind of keep the TTPs uh, to uh, uh, a narrow margin where, as the Colonel mentioned, uh, these are pretty smart kids coming to the military these days. They will pick this stuff up. Uh, it is that operational experience that, uh, that does need to be passed on from um, from generation to generation, um, they will keep coming uh, in the way of unmanned systems. Uh, we just need to make sure that how we've employed them in OEF and OIF uh, uh, is resident uh, in the training uh, in the schoolhouse pipeline. I would say on the trying to recoup expertise in manpower, I, I look at it a little bit differently. We're trying to figure out how to keep the fleet experience and feed it into unmanned, vice keeping unmanned, and again, that's probably just because of where we are in the process. Um, MQ-8 Fire Scout is, is out on its, I believe, seventh deployment. 
uh, right now on the frigates, and I don't know of anybody who's done a second deployment. Uh, wouldn't it be great uh, to have somebody in your debt when you go out there that says, hey, last time we did this, this is what worked, what didn't work, and you don't have to relearn. Obviously, we have lessons learned. We train the crews up, but that corporate experience uh, we have yet to build, I think, the way some of the other services have. And again, it's just a, a matter of uh, numbers of, of deployments and flight hours. And we're looking at ways to recoup folks that have flown BAMSD and feed them in as the initial cadre of folks into the Triton program. Uh, so there are opportunities to, to keep that expertise. All right, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, if we could get our colleagues with the mics, and if I could see a show of hands, if there's anyone who has a question. Uh, I think you were first, sir, and we'll bring it up to the front, right? All right. So could you um, just provide the Air Force's current vision? Do you see a potential, for example, an MQ-9 in cooperative flight with a fourth or fifth gen fighter, or is that still technologically and culturally a bridge too far at this point? Uh, Steve Tanner from Lockheed Martin. Yeah, so I, I, if it wasn't uh, obvious in the vector, sometimes, you know, as you try and hit every mission that you could you could possibly think of, uh, you know, we're not as specific as I think, certainly industry prefers more something more specific. But if you get into the teaming aspect and the loyal wingmen and uh, swarming to some degree, if you start talking in those terms, that's where, that's where we kind of address those issues. Uh, are, you know, do you, the perfect two in, in a formation is the guy that's always there and uh, just says two. So if it, can you automate that? You know, do you need a, a lieutenant that's still kind of figuring out how to do that, or can you automate that? Uh, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, can, one of the limitations of current man fighters today are, is, you know, at some point w when you build a, a few of very high-tech weapons, they're going to run out of munitions, and you got to go home and get some. So can you, can you provide uh, a loyal wingman or a truck, a bomb truck, if you will, that can that can be there uh, and just show up when you need them, and then you can direct and, and employ the weapons. So those concepts are definitely being debated inside the inside the building, and we've certainly talked to, to industry about how to do that. As far as connecting them to specific platforms, uh, often what I find is is that's a training and a software upgrade. You know, maybe add an antenna. So, I, and that's where I get back to the the technology part of this is generally not the hard part. It's trying to figure out how you want to use it and if it's valuable in combat. So that's kind of how we're approaching those problems. Uh, Otto Kreiser with Sea Power Magazine uh, for uh, Colonel Hickson and, and Captain Cognati. Uh, both, both of the services, the Naval Service, have been a little behind the Air Force and, and even on arming their unmanned systems. Uh, the Marines have looked at, you know, arming shadow. Uh, there's also been some talk about whether you can put a weapon system on your uh, ground, on some of your ground v uh, vehicles. Uh, and, and the Navy, you know, has talked about, but I haven't seen much action on what, what you're going to do with far as arming a, a f fire scout. Uh, I guess you've done, you've done some testing, but what's the status of that? Hi, uh, Sean Lingus with Federal Computer Week. Um, my question is, is how much of the erosion in uh, U.S. Um, edge in uh, unmanned systems is due to intellectual property theft, and um, what can be done about it? Um, I, I'm not sure I can comment on the intellectual property theft aspect of it. Uh, certainly that's a concern, uh, I think, across industry and across the department, but certainly any specifics I couldn't comment on. Um, on the Army, you ask about Fire Scout and APKWS. We have done um, the initial testing, and, and the, uh, we are looking to figure out when the first deployment of Fire Scout will be on board LCS. There, there's some small modifications to the ship that we'll need to do to carry APK, APKWS. For those of you who don't know, uh, it's a laser-guided uh, rocket system that we've, uh, uh, it's an, an older system not developed specifically for uh, the MQ-8, but we've adapted it to the MQ-8. And it's also common to the MH-60s uh, now that are, are carrying it, which will be nice for the combined nav debt flying both of the helicopters and having a common weapon on board. Um, and then the other, certainly, uh, as we uh, um, get into the definition of U-class, it, it is certainly going to be uh, uh, be armed. It's going to have a strike capability. Um, exactly how much and of what flavors yet to be determined. 
uh, but both those uh, um, will, both Fire Scout and U-Class certainly will be armed. Yeah, I apologize. I can't address the uh, intellectual question, but uh, on arming, uh, I will say that uh, uh, considering it between indirect and direct fires, uh, easier to weaponize a, a UAS and have a, a Marine employ that weapon as opposed to a, a ground unmanned system. Uh, infantry commanders are very hesitant to put um, a level of unmanned uh, weaponization um, in even with some autonomy uh, on a direct fire weapon because that round is going to keep going until it hits something that it probably shouldn't hit. Uh, Marine infantry commanders just generally like to have an eyeball behind that site. Uh, what they do want to see is some development in, uh, and I think the Army is already uh, uh, way ahead of us on this one. Um, can you link in uh, an authority to shoot uh, in an unmanned system, um, identify a target and have a Marine uh, say in an LAV or an AAV, identify a target or have the unmanned system identify a target and let, let that Marine go ahead and uh, press send on it. So, uh, uh, and those are in training systems, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and the Army uh, has already fielded those. I think the, that's one thing that uh, Marines would like to uh, jump into. Uh, but again, we're talking about um, uh, budget constraints, uh, especially in the way of simulations. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, yeah, so I, I can't speak to what's been stolen or not stolen or, you know, how that's been uh, been violated, but I do go back to my previous point of if you look at the technology we're using in some of the, at the very basic level, uh, it's it's really not that impressive. There, there are folks, our most savvy enemies that would be savvy enough to steal our secrets already know how to, to build a remotely piloted aircraft and, uh, and put a camera on it. Uh, the idea, the, the intellectual property that, that they're probably more looking at is how do we employ them in combat and, you know, being able to do joint operations, uh, work with coalition partners, uh, have a, a global responsibility where we're really looking at how do we, how do we cover the globe versus just a spot over the ground. Uh, th those are the harder problems to solve. Even employing weapons, you know, I, I always find it interesting when you see the newsreel clips of, of third world civil wars where you've got guys holding weapons over their head and firing around corners, unaimed fire, uh, looking down mortar tubes, things like that where you go, okay, this is not a well-trained force. Uh, and then certainly when you get into the third dimension and you start talking air power, uh, it, it gets harder and harder, uh, one, to deliver weapons and, and, and two, to have it be effective. Uh, and those are, those are the types of problems that, that, that are really the hard part to solve. They've, we've got, uh, in fact, I think one of the uh, senior level engineering classes at the Air Force Academy bought parts off the shelf and put together a UAV and then dropped a, a bomb inside of a, a one meter target for, for a science project. So, I mean, those are guys that, that understand air power and, and are well educated, but uh, have bought parts off the shelf and, and, and figured out how to, to, to employ them. So. I guess I'm less concerned about that type of intellectual property than some of the other stuff that's out there. The uh, RPA force is, is, is somewhat low tech, as surprising as that may sound. The headline tomorrow is going to be Academy folks are dropping bombs. Um, so yeah, uh, I think we caveat for that. That may yeah. be the one that gets me. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one more set uh, if we keep it tight. So up in the front and. Uh, the lady down the middle of the aisle. Thanks. Good morning, sirs. Uh, my name is Dan Matthews from Kinetic North America. Thanks for your time. Um, my question is, how should we manage the shift from using unmanned platforms in sort of niche missions and capabilities such as IED defeat, for example, to more broader, all-encompassing sets of mission profiles like convoys, logistics, uh, maybe even advanced strike? Um, in my view, in order to sustain the lead in technology and innovation, innovative con-ops, uh, they need to be introduced into more of those broader uh, mission sets. Um, and that also is where it's assumed that some of the efficiencies will come. But there's also organizational resistance to things like that. The debate over the stealth or non-stealth U-class procurement is sort of indicative of that. So as we move, as we make that transition, how should we do that, uh, maybe from within your cultures and where you sit? Thanks. 
Hi, my name is Sarah Hahn. I'm from Open Society Foundations. And just to pick up on your last comment, um, how there's been a lot of discussion about sharing UAS technology with American allies. Um, to what extent are those allies prepared technologically in terms of skills to adopt that technology? And how, how is the U.S. military addressing that, that question? Thank you, ma'am. All right, we've got about five minutes, gents. Okay. Um, I, I, a quick comment on both. I, I honestly, I think from my vantage point, the cultural piece has been overstated. Um, I, I think there are a lot of smart folks in all the services that know the value of these systems. Um, there are certainly folks who say, hey, put me in a cockpit, don't want any of that. Um, they're fewer and fewer every year, um, and you'll see a generational change. Um, I don't see that as a showstopper. The integration piece is certainly uh, with U-Class. Uh, we are, it's going to be fully integrated into the carrier air wing. It is not going to be off in a corner doing ISR by itself. It is going to be uh, linked to the Growler, to the E2D, to all the other aircraft in the air wing um, in, a, in, a, in a combined fashion. Certainly, it'll be a crawl, walk, run uh, approach to, to doing that because there's challenges uh, both technologically and as we talked about and, and, and operationally. But we're, we're going to work through those and it will be fully integrated. Um, what was the second question? It was on the second question was on uh, technology sharing, and I, I think yeah. we'll tackle that pretty hard in the second panel as well. Okay. But, but if you have something to add, please. I, I would just say that uh, I participate in the Joint Capability Group for Unmanned Air Systems through NATO. Um, I'm the head of the U.S. delegation to that group. One of the things we, we find with our partners, um, certainly different tiers, some of them uh, own and operate, um, you know, every bit is, you know, UAS that are every bit as good and capable as ours. There's others that for budgetary reasons can't afford them, but they're interested in the technology. And we look more on technology side on the interoperability of the PED. We would like our, all of our allies to be able to, to, to have access to the data and to be able to process it when we're working in conjunction with those countries. So uh, the technology transfer part, not as much, I think, on the air vehicles as it is on the use of the data. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just address quickly the coalition um, uh, question. I, I actually have a published paper that you could probably find online as well that talks about, uh, you know, building partnership capacity by using the uh, remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, and, the, and the bottom line is we would like our allies, as with, as with any weapon system, we would like to have interoperability, uh, the ability to train and fight together, uh, especially if there's close partners. Uh, if you look at the... Uh, the issues behind that, the uh, you know, some of our partners are more capable than others uh, based on where we are in the world, uh, certainly at the high end. And when you're talking inside of NATO, I think they're all highly capable uh, type countries that we could interoperate and uh, train and, and fight together when needed. Uh, but as you go into s sort of the, the third world uh, excursions, uh, the, you just got to remember that these are not global powers. They a lot of times are interested in, what, in seeing things internally or at their borders. Uh, and that's just a, a different problem set than what we've built and trained for. And, and in some cases, you could argue they may not even need the, the technology that we have. So uh, it's an interesting problem. What our allies do bring, though, is uh, uh, access, logistics, uh, uh, they solve the problems as we go forward that may that that we may not have solved, uh, and then it makes our transition to to an operation just that much easier. Um, and in that respect, I, I would say we need to we need to work on on those allies and making sure that that we're ready to train and fight together as necessary. Okay, I can address uh, the first question. Um, and I mentioned that the Marine infantrymen are kind of hesitant about um, unmanned systems working with them. At the very least, or maybe at the very most, uh, our ground combat element Marines uh, would want to have augmented unmanned capability uh, and not to replace what a Marine can do. It's the most dangerous thing, uh, but it's the best thing that we can put out in the field as a Marine and a rifle. If we can enhance this capability, let's do it with augmented capability in an unmanned system. If we're going to replace anything, let's look at the forward operating bases. Let's look at combat support and combat service support. So uh, I think the L3S or the GUS, uh, those kind of things that can uh, really uh, free a Marine to fight uh, and take care of some of those combat service support issues uh, in, in a, a secure environment uh, while Marines are outside the wire. That's probably where the focus, and I think the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab is, uh, I think, focusing a lot of their uh, ground side unmanned systems uh, development uh, in that realm. All right, thanks, Lieutenant Colonel Hickson. 
Uh, everyone, thank you so much for coming today. You're all important voices in this uh, uh, very uh, pertinent discussion uh, that we have ongoing in our uh, United States government as well as our uh, Department of Defense and other agencies. Uh, so thank you for attending and being a part of this. Please keep your seats unless you uh, need to use the facilities. Uh, we will transition immediately to the second panel. And I'd just like everyone to please give a round of applause to our expert officers for their service and their time. <laughs>